Amen. Zechariah chapter, chapter 4. Reading two verses, starting in verse 6. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. As we have been learning the message of the cross for the last, as a ministry, 30 years plus, it is clear that the design and the purpose of God, at least in my mind, for giving us this truth, was not just to teach us and retrain us how to live for God, but also, it doesn't stop there. It is to teach and retrain us how to labor for God. Not just a holy life, but a holy labor. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. It's not enough for you to come down to an altar. Thank God for the baptism with the Holy Spirit. But it would be one of the greatest tragedies for you to simply come and have an experience, but not be taught that the key to a constant supply of the Holy Spirit is a lifestyle of submitting and surrendering to the Holy Spirit. And that is what I hope to convey tonight. Our greatest enemy is the flesh, but of course our strength and our power, it's not in human might, not in human power, but it's by the Spirit of our God, and I wanna minister this word to you tonight entitled, A Holy Life and a Holy Labor. Would you pray with me and for me? Father, in these next few moments, I thank you first of all for the privilege to open up your word, which is our bread, it is our lifeline. We thank you tonight for your word that leads us and guides us, and I ask for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to come and help me tonight to share this word. Anoint the ears of the listeners, and Lord, I'll ask it in Jesus' name. Let us leave this place not the same way we came in. We ask it in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. 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 I'm reminded of a powerful truth that I've heard growing up here at the ministry and it's this, that our greatest victories as a child of God are God's victories over us. I'm gonna say it again, and I pray the Holy Spirit would lodge it deep in the recesses of your soul. Our greatest victories as a Christian are God's victories over us. It may be contrary to human thought, but as he said in his word, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. And the pattern of those who would labor for God is laid out all throughout the scripture and I'm reminded tonight of a message very unique. Brother Swaggart came and presented it to us on a Sunday morning, I think three or four years ago. It, it possibly could have been longer. And he uniquely that morning said these words. He said, what I'm about to give you concerns the work which lies ahead. And he said, it's going to be more of a prophetic word because the days the years, 
the work that we have set before us, and I believe with all my heart, as Brother Donnie said this morning, this is not a work that was begun by the ingenuity of man. It was begun and birthed by the Holy Spirit. But being that is the truth and being that as it may, we've got to recognize the need to understand that we must walk softly before the Lord. Those that have been called to labor alongside this ministry, I count myself as one who has, my family. We've got to remember this, and he shared this that morning from the great book of Joshua, chapter five. And he said, and he brought out that morning four points lay there in that text, chapter five of Joshua. First of all, they had come out of the wilderness wanderings and they had just traversed Jordan's river as the priests bore the ark and they came across on dry ground miraculously. And there at Gilgal, the burdens of the wilderness were rolled away. But amazingly, The Bible tells us that all the men of war who had lasted throughout the wilderness wanderings had died off. Miraculously, the group that God had engineered, had marshaled and called, that was going to take the promised land, they were not men of war. They were not trained. They had no experience, but that would be to their strength and to their credit. And not only were they not men of war, they had died off, but this second generation of Israelites having no experience in such a war or such battle, God said to Joshua, I want you to deplete and take away the strength of all of the young fighting men of Israel and have them circumcised. Speaking of separation, Speaking of separation from our greatest enemy, which is self today, it's self. And we must understand some things from this fifth chapter, and I wanna read this to you right out of the commentary, and if you don't have a set of commentaries, I'd encourage you to get them. It's been one of my greatest resources, the greatest, no doubt, resource in my Christian journey. In this chapter, we're given God's blueprint for victory. Isn't that what we want? We're given his blueprint for victory. Number one, death to self. The testimony, number two, the testimony to the blood and of the lamb. For after they were circumcised, they kept the Passover. Number three, they no longer ate the manna of the wilderness, but they ate the old corn of the land, and it's a type of feeding on the word of God. Number four, they found the captain of the Lord of hosts, and there Joshua subjected himself to the captain of the Lord of hosts. And let's look at these truths. Let's first of all look at death to self. Verse two says this, Make you sharp knives and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. Listen, the battle with self is never ended. Once and for all, it'll never go away. The need to submit, not only, as I said earlier, to have an experience where the Spirit of God gifts us greatly so, as he did the early church in the book of Acts, But oh, we've come to learn that the message of the cross not only changes our life, but alters the way we labor for God. And we must understand that it cannot be any strength of man, no military prowess, no ability to to, to, uh, marshal forces or or, or to cultivate a group or a committee. And and it's not based on a personality or, or some type of prowess in the individual, but it's as As Zechariah said, it's not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. Not only do we need that spirit of God to come into our lives initially, but we must submit to the captain of the Lord of hosts, understanding that the promised land, yes, 
was promised by God. But as we walk into that land, every place knowing the sole of our feet shall tread, he's already given it to us, but it's not automatic that you and I will rely on the strength and power of God. Why do you think that the power of the Spirit came upon Zechariah to issue this word to Israel? The word of God reminds us that the work of the temple had halted for some years. And in order for the work to be accomplished, they had to rely not, on, not only on that initial filling, but on a constant filling of the Holy Spirit, again, which only comes through a denial of self. Denial of self. They were circumcised the second time. Again, a constant conflict. There's never a time that the ending of war will take place on this side of eternity. That battle between the flesh and the spirit, between carnal Christianity and spiritual Christianity is ongoing. Can I get an amen? amen. And death to the self, to, to self rather, is illustrated in circumcision. Most of the time when we think of separation, we're thinking of separation from the world. And it certainly does include that. The world is an enemy. However, our biggest enemy, of which circumcision is a type, is self. What type of self are we speaking of? Now listen, strangely enough, the self part of man that must be separated by the Spirit of God is that which we would call good. And so what, we, what do we need to be separated from? It's man's natural wisdom and goodness. It's most bitter for a man to learn that all his goodness must be slain with the sword of the Lord just as much as all of his badness. But to the Christian, this is most sweet, for it brings him into a resurrection life, and the power of that life takes all strength from Satan. Man, irregardless of his religion or his goodness, has no strength against Satan. Jericho's walls never fall before him in our own strength. And he had them circumcised to remind them self cannot perform the work of God. And I believe it with all my heart, it was a prophetic word. The tendency is to rely on the strength of man. Zechariah said it, you heard it this morning, not by might nor by power. That word might, of course, is speaking of a collective effort. It's interesting that we can usually detect a lack of dependence on the Holy Spirit by those who would like to form a committee in order to perform the work of God. Not only do they point to an effort that man can muster up in his own strength, but they point, second word, he said, not by might nor by power to the specific personality traits of an individual. They did this in Paul's church, and we can do it today. They would say, I am of Paul. We would say today, we would love to be of Paul. We would love to associate ourselves, and we do, as preaching his message. But listen, carnality was also in the church of Paul, and it can be in our church today. When you associate yourself with a personality, when you associate what God's doing in your life with a man or a title or an organization, or yes, I'll say it, with SBN, and I thank God and I've already declared that I believe God's raised it up, but some of us are associating, not participating. There's a difference. And one is carnal and the other is spiritual. And so the, the, the reason this is so important, as we look to the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul was fearful 
that the worldly wisdom of, and Greek philosophy had infiltrated the church, and it had. And that worldly philosophy, the wisdom of the world, will always produce carnal Christianity. And he was fearful that the understanding and the wisdom of the wise would distort the learning of the message of the cross. And that's it today, friends. The wisdom of the world is our greatest enemy to the promulgation of the message of the cross. And it has infiltrated our churches. And it has infiltrated our denominations. The wisdom of the world. And it is what Paul said in that first First book to Corinth, the Corinthians caused division and contention and carnality and worship of man and pastor worship and I'm of Paul and sectarian division and I'm elite and you're little, you're little Christian and I'm big Christian. Carnality. The, word, the worldly wisdom of men will always bring division. The message of the cross will lay it waste. The true doctrine of the cross does not elevate man on a pedestal. It lets us know, like Paul would say in chapter 3, who are we but co-laborers with God? Some water, some plant, but God gives the increase. Get your eyes off of an organization. Get your eyes off of man. It's not by might nor by power, but it's by my spirit. Say it the Lord. Carnal Christianity there, Paul would go on and he would say this, that we run the risk of our work being lost for what we're building with is just wood, hay, and stubble. And at the judgment seat of Christ, that work, which is so holy in the eyes of God, it will not last the eyes that are a flame of fire, the man whose feet are fine brass. It will not outlast the seven eyes of perfect judgment, which is upon the Messiah. It will be burned up. You will suffer Lost, be saved, though as by fire. He says, if carnal Christianity persists, we also run the risk of defiling the temple. Hallelujah. Not only our individual lives, but the corporate body of Christ. And he issues this warning. He who defiles the temple, him will God destroy. We've seen ministers falling. We've witnessed it, but let me say this. What we see with the eye is not always what's going on in the spirit world. Amen. God said, he who defiles my temple will I destroy. And sometimes, always, failure is, a, is really not God's first priority. Public exposure is his last ditch effort to get our attention and under, get us to understand that something's just not right. We're trying to take the promised land by might, by power. We're trying to accomplish this work he's called us to do in our own strength through the wisdom of the world. And he says, he who defiles the temple, him shall God destroy. But as this morning, Brother Donnie, he pointed out to us so true. In Zechariah's vision, chapter 4, he says, Zechariah says, I was awakened as a man out of sleep, and I saw a golden candlestick. And if we had an outline for the passage which lies before us tonight, it's simply this. The work of God depends upon the person of Christ. Number two, the work of God must be carried out by the power of the Holy Spirit. Number three, as he said 
that you will, he, you will see and you will hear that headstone being laid by Zerubbabel with shoutings, grace, grace unto it. Not only is your labor and your work for the kingdom dependent, it hangs upon the deity of Christ. Not only must it be carried out by the Holy Spirit, but there is no story in the Christian, in the Christian world that isn't written with the wor without the words grace, grace. You cannot finish. The work of God is only finished by grace. I'm gonna say it again. It depends the work that God's called you to. It's not dependent on your goodness. We see that in the third chapter. Very clearly, I don't want time to go into all of it. But the Bible tells us in the third chapter of Zechariah that Satan, that's your enemy, not people, but Satan, he stood to resist Joshua the high priest. Did you know that Revelation chapter 12 tells us Satan is always resisting? He accuses the brethren day and night. Did you know that? We gotta be careful that, as some have said, and some Christians help him do it, standing and accusing day and night. But as Paul said, put on, let your loins be girded with truth and put on the breastplate of righteousness. That's our greatest defense against the accusations of Satan. And tonight, some of you, your greatest enemy is doubt and unbelief that you're not qualified to work for God because there's been some kind of failure in your life and in the past. Listen, the greatest, the most qualified to work for God are those who recognize that they are unqualified. When they walked into the promised land, they had to realize, oh my, we don't have the strength to face this enemy. But it's like Jehoshaphat in his day. They said, we see this great enemy. We don't have what it takes, but our eyes are upon you. And the word of the Lord to Jehaziel, one of the sons of Asaph, yeah, came in the midst of God's people and he said this, this battle is not yours but the Lord's, you will not need to fight in this battle. It's not by might, nor by power. And as we look in chapter three, Joshua stands there and it's very clear, his garments are sullied. But God answers, and he says this, behold, I have caused your iniquity to pass from you, and I will clothe you with a change of raiment. In the natural, none of us are qualified to work for God. But tonight, if your failure is stopping you from getting your hand and taking it to the plow, if it's caused you, as Jesus said, to put the plow down and turn back again, let me tell you tonight, his justifying work, it goes further and deeper and higher and wider than the mind of man can imagine. That's why this work is not based on imperfect man, represented by the six candlestick pipes. But when you add the center candlestick, the perfect Christ to an imperfect church. I can get up tomorrow, though I failed him yesterday, and I may fail him today, I can get up and be clothed in new garments because I'm justified by the blood. And my work and my labor depends on that perfect golden candlestick. If you'd allow me to, I want us to reach in to the great gospel of Matthew chapter 16 and pull out five words that Jesus, he would declare to his disciples in, the, in verse 18, I 
will build my church. He placed the emphasis on I. That means this, the work of building the church hangs not on your prowess, not on your power, but on the deity, the person of Christ. When we consider a builder, we ask the question, does his friends recommend him? Does he have what it takes? Is he insured? Does he have the experience? Well, the astounding thing was at this time when Jesus declared this to his disciples, that he is a carpenter by trade, hadn't built anything any larger than a stool or a plow. And so it makes us shirk back just a little bit when we realize the audacity of what Christ declared, that he would build something so durable that it would last every diabolical effort of Satan to destroy it, for he said the gates of hell would not prevail against it. He would build it until it outlasts and outshined the sun, the moon, and the stars. At that great day, when the glory within is gonna be revealed without. But does he have that experience or the credentials or the power to do what he's declared he's gonna do and he's going to finish his work? Does he have what it takes? Jesus very often would associate himself personally with the words which, cry, which, fa, which the Father spoke to Moses at the burning bush. I am that I am. When he met the woman at the well and he opened up her past before her sinful eyes, she said, I know when the Messiah comes, he will show us and teach us all things. He said, woman, I am. In John chapter six, when he fed the hungry multitude, he said, I am the bread of life. In John chapter eight, when he stood before the scribes and Pharisees, he said, before Abraham was, I am. And they looked at him in astonishment and they said, what are you talking about? You're not even 50 years old. And he said, before Abraham was, I am. In John chapter nine, when he healed a boy that was born blind, he said, I am the light of the world with emphasis on I am. In John chapter 10, he declared, I am the door of the sheepfold. I am the good shepherd. He's the good shepherd tonight. In John chapter 12, before sorrowing Mary and Martha, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes on me shall never die. He that believes on me shall live again. In John chapter 14, the passage we all know so well, he said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. In John chapter 15, he said, I am the true vine. In John chapter 18, as Judas and those murderous brigands came with, with, with equipment of war armed to the teeth, and they said they were looking for Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus squared his shoulders and he stood and looked at him and said, I am. And the amazing thing was when he said this, they went backward and fell to the ground. Just at the mention of the I am of the church, I'm trying to tell you tonight that the work doesn't depend on your strength, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit.
and what they witnessed that day, one day is what the world's going to witness. If just such a faint glimpse of his deity could cause a battalion of soldiers to lay prostrate on the ground, what do you think's going to happen when he splits the eastern sky and he comes back with the glory which he had before the world was? When he comes back with the glory of the ages, when he comes back with the glory of the angels, when he comes back with his own glory. Paul said that he's been highly exalted and given a name which is above every name in heaven and below the earth and on the earth that at the name of Jesus every knee would bow and every tongue would confess. I am, I am that I am. He said in Revelation chapter one, I am he who was dead and am alive forevermore. And I hold the keys of death and of hell. I am the root and the offspring of David. I am the bright and the morning star. Would somebody say amen tonight? Does he have what it takes? Does the work depend upon that golden candlestick and the spirit which flows out from him? Yes, it does. Can he accomplish this work? Not by might, nor by power, but by might. It won't be you, but it'll be the I am of the church. I, the divine builder, will the divine decree, build the divine method, my, the divine title deed, church, the divine structure. He's able, no one else can do it. You better get in line with him. You better repent of all sin. You better lay it at his feet. You better go forward in the strength and the power of Christ, not in your own might. He stacked up the waters of the Red Sea so they could walk across on dry ground. He calls water to come out of a rock and manna on the ground. He holds the power of the worlds in the palm of his hand. He defied Caesar. He tore back the bars of death. And as one preacher said, he threw the machinery of death into reverse. That's the Christ the great I am. He is the means of accomplishing the work God's called you to do. Singers, musicians, come back. The work he's called you to do depends upon his person. It depends upon his spirit. And only can it be completed by the grace of God. He said, you will hear shoutings of grace, grace unto it. Isn't it interesting how we see Paul associating the work of the Holy Spirit with the word grace? Even the gifts of the Spirit, they depend upon that one word, charis, charismata. That's because of this. When Paul taught the message of the cross, he didn't just teach us that we were to live a holy life, but that we were to operate in a holy labor. And the only means of supply of the Spirit on a constant basis is a denial of self, taking up the cross daily. And Paul, as he didn't just preach this, but he lived it, I can hear him saying this in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. He said, I labored more abundantly than they all. Speaking of the apostles, but listen to what he said. He said, it wasn't I, 
but the grace of God which was with me. The message of the cross will redesign your life, but it will also give you a ministry for the kingdom of God, a work to accomplish in this last day through the grace of God. Amen. Would you stand with me tonight? Hallelujah. It depends on his strength, not upon us, not upon our associations, not upon our talent, but upon the one that this word speaks about, Christ. He will finish the work he began. But he leaves us with this, the great prophet Zechariah, he said, don't despise the day. You know, this is what the flesh does. It looks at the work going on now and it says, ah, it's not like what it used to be. But the prophet through the spirit of the Lord said this, do not despise the day of small things. For what you're seeing being built right now, ask Brother Swaggart, 82 years ago nearly, he began building the kingdom of God. The Spirit threw him, of course. Ask him, Brother Swagger, do you have any regrets? No regrets. Why? Don't despise the day of small things. What you're building and what you're a part of, it is an eternal weight of glory. You're building the temple of God. You're building the eternal house of God. Has Satan caused you to shirk back from the call? These altars are open tonight. What you need is another dose of the Holy Ghost. You need the grace that comes from the cross of Christ to imbue you, to empower you, to strengthen you one more time. It's a lifestyle, but it's the only life worth living. Would you come to these altars as they sing whatever they feel led? He'll give you his grace tonight to accomplish the work. Hallelujah. Oh, there's nothing, nothing better. Better than you. Oh, there's nothing.
tonight. Come on one more time, give him a shout of praise tonight. I know all of you or many of you are going to be leaving here either tonight or in the morning. We just want to once again pray over all of you and ask the Lord to protect you as you leave and uh, that you can come back safe next year for our next IYC next July and you don't want to miss it. So here's what I want us to do. Stretch forth your hands right now and let's just pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you tonight. We ask your blessings upon every person who came to this conference this week. We're asking that you'd bless them in their coming. Bless them in their going. Lord, we're asking that you would protect them as they leave to go home tonight or tomorrow. Lord, we're asking that there would be a flame of fire rest upon each and every single one of them. That they would turn their schools and their cities and their communities right side up for the cause of Christ. And we ask it all in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Turn around, tell your neighbor you love him. Be back with us next year for IYC. We love you. God bless you. Come, Holy Spirit, I may need thee. Come, Holy Spirit, I pray. Come in thy strength and thy power. Come in thine own gentle way. Oh, come, Holy Spirit, I need We hope you've enjoyed this live service from International Youth Conference 2024. For more information, visit our website at jsmiyc.org.